the order. Please bear with me. First and foremost, we have a youth rally coming up about a month from now. Still a lot of things to do. Please, people start thinking about this, start praying about it. Start preparing in your mind what you can do to help. Nobody does their best work unprepared. Let's do our best. If we don't encourage young people, then soon enough, not only this congregation, but all the congregations will be in. We'll be bringing up more about that. Going to be talking a lot more about it in the next four weeks. Don't throw song books at me. Don't, don't get wore out with me. Start thinking about how you can help with that. Kyle Phillips was in an accident on Tuesday. Very bad accident. He had surgery and is recovering in ICU. He's been stuck down. Okay, he's been, he's been stepped down from ICU. I know that he is walking. He's got a very long recovery ahead of him. Remember Kyle and his family in your prayer. <clears throat> Jennifer Parsons had surgery March 30th. She's still in considerable pain as she recovers. And the doctor says it will take her about 30 days to fully recover. Appreciate your prayers. <clears throat> Ruth Lemon will be having medical tests uh, April 11th and April 26th. Please keep <coughs> during your prayers for good results. Bob Johnson has been put on hospice. Please keep him and Carol in your prayers. Please pray for Judy Davis as she is dealing with lung disease. She is on the transplant list. Paul and Ruth Ann Lemon's daughter. Paul Lemon is having some trouble standing and walking. Please remember Roy Clark as he is going through his treatments. He's had bad effects from those treatments and has been very sick. Uh, as a matter of fact, so sick that Karen said he couldn't have his chemo this week. So please remember Roy in the prayer. Remember Oakley, if she heals from her liver, liver surgery, she has developed some viruses. When she gets better, she will be going to the Ronald McDonald House for more recovery. <clears throat> Robert Dotson, a friend of Evelyn Duckworth, has stage 3 cancer. Please remember him in your prayers also. Also, Mackenzie, who has gone with his niece, had a biopsy. They are waiting on results uh, from that. Please remember her in your prayers for good results. Please remember Mark and Kathy Casanelli as they are traveling to stay with the baby for a few days and Karen Metz as she is traveling to North or South Carolina this week. I'm sure she'll go through North Carolina on her way there. <laughs> um, is there anything else concerning the sick needs to be announced. <clears throat> Mike Bowen passed away on Friday. <clears throat> Visitation will be two to four and six to eight tomorrow. The funeral will be uh, at 11 o'clock on Tuesday. The visitation will one hour prior. <clears throat> Lambert and Tatman on the south side. <clears throat> I 
I want to thank everyone. In case I forget, for your kind thoughts and prayers this past week. In our worship service. The first song is number four hundred and thirty nine, great. Given to you power from above, therefore, the one who delivered me to you, the one who delivered me to you, has greater sin. From then on, Fill it short to release him. The Jews cried out, saying, If you let the man go, you are you're not Caesar's friend. Whoever makes himself the king speaks against Caesar. Let's pray. Most righteous Heavenly Father, we come to you at this time in prayer. Thank you, Father, for this day you've given us and, any, and the, the blessings which you've given us in this uh, in this life, Father, and the freedoms that, that we have in this country. 
We pray, Father, for all those who are were mentioned this morning on the sick list and are, that are sick and uh, going through health uh, problems. Uh, we know there are many among us in the brotherhood here who are sick and dealing with serious issues. We pray, Father, at this time also for the family of Mike Vaughn. Uh, we just pray that uh, you would comfort his family and help them through this difficult time. We pray, Father, for all those who are struggling with different issues, Father. You know everyone's needs and you know what they are going through. And we, we just pray that, uh, that you would comfort each one of them people and our friends that are struggling with different issues at this time. We pray, Father, that uh, as we enter into this worship service this morning, that Everything is said and done here will be pleasing unto you and according to your word, your will. And we also pray for the different congregations, Father, throughout the world today that gather that uh, you that uh, that they will be pleasing unto you. We pray, Father, for the the uh, that the violence and war over in the uh, Ukraine would uh, soon end. And we pray for leaders throughout the world that they may work together for peace and and we pray that they would look to you for guidance and decisions they make uh, especially Father the, uh, we especially pray for the leaders of our churches or of congregations in, in throughout this uh, our congregation here throughout and then the congregation all of our congregations we pray for the elders people in leadership roles we pray for our elected officials in this country we pray father at this time also you just forgive us for your sin against you and we pray father that uh, you would be with us as we go through this day we pray all these things in your son jesus holy name amen Number 186.
this is, a, <clears throat> this is the first day of the week, the day that our Lord set aside for us to do this. Uh, by doing it every first day of the week, it keeps us reminded of the sacrifice he made. And he made that sacrifice so that we would not forget the things he went through, the suffering, and all this that he did, and done it all willingly. He did not have to do it, but full of his love for us, he did. And uh, so, as we do these uh, hot emblems here, we want to remember the sacrifice that he made and focus on the true meaning of what it is that we're doing. And uh, let's just give thanks for the bread. Father in heaven, we're so thankful for this bread, the bread that represents Christ's body, and the body that hung on the cross there on Calvary's head. <coughs> he died there, Father, for our sins, and made a price so that we could have a chance for eternal life. And again, instead of this day, the first day of the week, Pray, Father, that uh, you please bless this bread and bless us as we partake of it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We continue our prayer for the fruit of the vine. Father, we thank you so much for this fruit of the vine. Represents Christ's body, served with Christ's blood that was shed on that day when they crucified our Lord. The blood that run down and we wash away our sins, and without it, we have no chance for uh, salvation. And we thank you so much, Father, for just allowing us the opportunity to do this. And we ask, Father, that you please bless this fruit of the vine and bless us as we can take. Lord's Supper. Pass it back there on the table for anybody that wishes to make a contribution to the work of the church. Number 318.
number 406. So make sure you see her um, in a little while. If you can help with that dinner, appreciate that very much. That'll be on Tuesday. The funeral will be at 11, so it'll be after that. Acts chapter 19, as we look at Jesus, the final scene, if you will. We've been looking at bits and pieces of the trial of Jesus, and we come down to what would really be the final scene this Roman trial opens with Pilate's repeated attempts to free Jesus. Now, when we look at this verb, it, it's in the imperfect sense, meaning he was seeking or looking for an opportunity to, to let Jesus go, if you will, to free him. And, and it's a battle that Pilate seems to be having with those that are really have brought Jesus, the Jews, but more than that, the leading Jews. And they keep on wanting to punish Jesus. And as we looked at last week in the early parts of Acts chapter of John chapter 19, as, as Pilate wanted to appease them, if you will, and, and so he took Jesus and had him flogged and placed the crown of thorns on his head and, and put the purple robe on him to mock him and, and then brought him back out in front of the, the people just to say, okay, I've, I've punished him. Isn't that enough? Um, can, can we let him go now? I, I don't find any fault in him. Of course, they, they begin to, to rile around that and, and they come to a point where they're almost at a mob, mob mentality at this point. And they want to crucify him, and they want to kill him, and they want to punish him. Uh, as we look at this 
final area with Pilate this morning, I want to look at three specific things that, well, really we have to look at. Pilate seems to want to release Jesus. That's what his mouth is saying, isn't it? I find no fault in him. But yet he finds himself in, in an interesting circumstance because he seems to be reluctant. <clears throat> because the truth is he does not release Jesus, although he seems to want to, and he offers that option, and, and, and the people say, no, no, crucify him, crucify him, and, and, and go on and on, and, and you see this reluctance. And, and I wonder when we look at reluctance, what do we think of? But we know the passage in Acts chapter 26 where we have the Apostle Paul. And, and as the Apostle Paul is, is talking to King Agrippa in and, and his defense, and, and in verse chapter 26, verse 27, King Agrippa, do, do you believe the prophets? I know you believe. And, and so he finds King, King Agrippa said, yeah, at the point where, yes, he, he seems to believe the prophets. But in the next verse, he says, Agrippa said to Paul, in a short time, you have persuaded me to become a Christian. And other versions will say, you almost persuaded me to become a Christian. And there's no record in the Bible of King Agrippa ever becoming a Christian. I wonder if the day that King Agrippa stands before God, if he's reluctant. I wonder if Pilate, the day that he stands before God, is reluctant that he didn't become a Christian. I wonder sometimes if, if we're reluctant that, that we didn't talk to our friends and family about Christ. See, the easy thing to do is go with the crowd, isn't it? Whatever the crowd is doing, we just go with that and, and nobody notices us any different than anybody else. The hard thing to do is, is to kind of stick out, isn't it? Is to talk to family and friends about Jesus and let them know that you love them and you want the best for them. But when we think of this situation that Pilate finds himself in, verse 12, it says, from then on. It, it might have been from an earlier point because he really sought to release Jesus at, at an earlier point, but, but John points out that, that this is the time where we're no, there's no turning back here. But from then on, Pilate sought to release him, but the Jews... You see, Pilate's thought was, well, I'm going to release him. I, I don't know why they want to kill him. I find no fault in him. And it could have been superstition because we, we, we looked at that a little bit last week and that superstitious aspect of it. And, and it could have been political. And, and, and we know that we see some political statements in, in, in this verse here. And, and so, but there's some reason that even though he wanted to do it, you know, on Judgment Day, will he be reluctant because he didn't do it? But you hear the cry from the crowd saying, well, well no, don't release him. The, the, the Jews cried out, if you release this man, you're no friend of Caesar's. And everyone who makes himself a king opposes Caesar." Well, this is interesting because we go back to the days of Babylon when we talk about people making themselves a king, don't we? We know that from studying Ezekiel, that the king of Tyre made himself a king. The king of Egypt made him, the, the pharaoh, made himself a king. And, and so when we come years later to this Roman Empire and, and, and Caesar there and, and, and he, you know, he's the one who, who has made himself a king, if you will. And if anyone else approaches that throne and says, well, I'm a king. And, and no, no, we're going to have to. It, it's, it's interesting because the Jews are saying this and the Jews really have no affairs with the Roman government. It's not their, their, they have their own 
things set up and their own way of doing things, their own government, their own, but, but, but they're using this to get rid of Jesus. So Pilate, verse 13, when he heard these words, he brought Jesus out. He, he set him down on the, what they call the judgment seat at the place called the stone pavement in Aramaic Gabbatha. And, and so you have Jesus displayed, if you will, waiting for whatever's going to happen next. Pilate was yielded to the murderous intent of the Jewish leaders and unwittingly contributed to the accomplishment of God's overall plan for Jesus to die. As Pilate was on the verge of announcing the, the acquittal in the case of Jesus, the Jews protested and shouted, if you release this man, you're no friend of Caesar. So here's our political angle. And, and, and he wanted to be a friend of Caesar. Then he, he certainly did not want to be an enemy. And, and so he feels the political pressure of this on himself. Matthew chapter 27, verse 24. So when Pilate saw that he was gaining nothing, but rather that a riot was beginning, he took water and washed his hands before the crowd, saying, I'm innocent of this man's blood. See to it yourself. But this didn't cleanse his heart. It was kind of Pilate really on trial here. Luke 19 and verse 14, but his citizens hated him. Sent a delegation to him after saying, we do not want this man to reign over us. So from the human standpoint, if you will, the trial of Jesus was the greatest crime and tragedy in history. From a divine Standpoint, it was the fulfillment of prophecy and the accomplishment of the will of God. And so we have to combine these two standpoints, the human standpoint and the divine standpoint. And as Christians, we have a certain part of us that, that is glad that Jesus went to the cross, aren't we? Because without that, we would not have a hope of a hope in, uh, in heaven. And, and, and so we're kind of glad that this happened. Well, we were glad that the sacrifice had to happen. From, from a human standpoint, we're like, well, we didn't want it to happen even like that. Acts chapter 2, verse 23. This Jesus delivered up according to the divine plan and foreknowledge of God. <coughs> and crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. But, well, secondly, I want to know, it's not only, only the reluctance. But let's talk about the king aspect, if you will. Um, is Jesus the king? That was the question that was really on the mind of them, isn't it? Jesus said, well, I'm the king of the Jews. And so they, they put him as king. They, they, they put a robe on him and put him out there and said, well, Pilate said, well, if you say you're a king, we're going to treat you like a king. And they, they mocked him, and they spat on him, and they slapped him, and, and, and they made fun of him, and, and, and thinking, well, if you're a king, obviously kings have power, don't they? Someone will come to his aid if, if you're treating him poorly. Notice verse 14 now, when it was the day of preparation of the Passover. And now the timing of this is just, just interesting because it, just about any other time we wouldn't have these roadblocks that are put in the way, but, but we do. We have this preparation of the day of the Passover. So the preparation is on the Friday. The Passover would begin on Saturday. The Sabbath, preparation for the Sabbath. And, and, and so they would begin a, a Old Testament ritual of a certain time of day. They weren't allowed to do certain things on the day before the Sabbath. And especially when it's at a Passover week, 
And so it's about the sixth hour with Jewish reckoning. You have two types of reckoning here. You have the Roman reckoning for the time and the Jewish reckoning. Of the Jewish reckoning, they would put it about noon. So we're about noontime, and he said to the Jews, Behold your king. Now, now this was meant to not say, you, you know, the king is here, the king is coming, but it was meant to be a put down. This is your king. Well, this is your king. Life's pretty sad, isn't it? I want you to notice how everybody is thinking. And then I want you to think about this. Sometimes we need to change our thinking. Everybody, including the apostles that are around Jesus, are thinking physically. Aren't they? In human terms. They say, well, they're human beings. They shouldn't be thinking. And to a certain aspect, that's true. They're thinking, well, if someone says they're a king, that means they're they're holding an office above a, a, a town or a country or something like that. They're in this place, and, and they should be in that place. That means they're going to be direct to that place. Now, Israel had been wanting a king for years. They've been looking for the right king, and they've had several good kings and several bad kings, and and if you see, they you know, ever since they said they wanted a king, it's really been a struggle for them. God really didn't want to give them a king, and so they're 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 looking over this king thing, saying if you know, and those people who are following Jesus, as close as friends and apostles, are saying, well, if Jesus were the king, then things would just be great in the land. If we only had this person as a king. And, and, of course, those in Jewish leadership didn't want that to happen at all. And, and, and so we go back to the Old Testament passage in Deuteronomy that we looked at last week that talks about anyone who says they're a king is really, you know, or the son of God, and anyone that says they're the son of God it is dishonoring God. And, and so we have this back and forth, and, and, and we put the man on display. We, we have him on the, the, the pavement there, you know, where the judgment seat said, this is your king. This represents you. John 19, verse 41. Now the place where he was crucified was a garden. And in the garden was a new tomb in which no one had been laid. So because of the Jewish day of preparation, since the tomb was close at hand, they laid Jesus there. See, right now, timing important because we have a short time to do this. The best thing for Pilate to do in his situation would just be say, I don't care what you're saying. Now, I really find this interesting because as I think about this situation and thought about this situation all week, I, I see a judge, if you will, Pilate the judge. And judges normally make their decision innocent or guilty. Isn't that true? You're innocent or you're guilty. And based on the judge's decision, unless it's a jury, based on the judge's or jury's decision, the, the, there's either punishment or they're set free. This is the way this scene come, seemed to come down. With no jury, just the judge making his decision of innocent. And then the people in the courtroom, the audience, if you will, the, the onset say are saying, no, 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 your honor, he's guilty. We demand that you punish him. And the judge is saying, no, I don't find any guilt in him at all. And, and the people in the courtroom say, no, no, you punish him, you punish him. And so the judge reverses course, and I've never met a judge like this in my life, and I've known a few that would reverse course and say, okay, well, we're going to punish him just because y'all, without evidence, say he's guilty. Well, that's not a court I want to be in. But it seemed like the, this was the court that Jesus was in. John 19, verse 13. So when Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus out, sat him down the judgment seat, the place called the stone pavement. Pilate didn't announce a, a sentence as the Jews expected to hear. Instead, Pilate turned, they're taunted by the Jews, and behold, your king. 
could have just said, well, the sentence is death, but he says, behold your king. And, and he makes the presentation. So when we think Pilate it invited the Jews to recognize him as king, as their Jesus, recognize Jesus, who would he be? And, and I guess the, the question for us to look at today is who is Jesus to you? Who is Jesus to you? Now, now he's presented as a king, and, and many of them said, no, no, he's not my king. Crucify the man. I don't want to have anything to do with the man. Get rid of the man. And, and, and I want to show you that it's really going with the crowd. It's the way the crowd wanted to go. Have you ever been in a situation where the crowd kind of led the way? Then you find out that you're going the wrong way. Following the crowd isn't always the best thing, is it? And, and so you see this, this following of the crowd here. I want you to notice a few things about Jesus as king and, and where he's at in our life. Philippians chapter 2, verse 8 and following. Paul says this about Christ after the fact. He says, being found in human form, or New King James, being found in the form of a man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even the death of a cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him, bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that the name of Jesus every knee shall bow in heaven, on earth, under the earth, every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Now this verse wasn't written when they presented Jesus as king. But, you know, there comes the point where everyone that was out there saying, crucify him, crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. Paul said that, guess what? There will be a time where you bow your knee. There will be a time where it comes out of your mouth that this Jesus is both Lord and Master to the glory of who? The Father. By us confessing Jesus is Lord and man. If we have that relationship with Jesus as King now, and, and, and you know the question goes back to Pilate and the Jews that were standing there: Is this your King? And the question goes to us: Is Jesus our King? Brother Melvin Ote, one of my friends who preaches the gospel, when he preaches on Jesus. And, and, and I don't know when he, Brother Ote, started doing this. A, he's he's a, a lawyer by trade and different things, but he always says, King Jesus. And I find that interesting because when we talk about Jesus, Jesus is our King, isn't he? Revelation. Chapter 1, verse 5, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, the ruler of kings on the earth, to him who loves us, freed us from our sins by his blood. Yeah. Revelation 17, verse 14 tells us this, they'll make war on the Lamb. That's Jesus right there. They'll make war on the Lamb. And the Lamb will conquer them, for he is Lord of hosts, King of kings. Those who with him are called, chosen, and faithful. So Pilate spoke more truth than he realized. The king for whom Jesus had long was standing, or the Jews had long was standing in front of him the whole time. But they couldn't see him. The last thing, I want you to notice something a little bit different. I want to go in a little different direction here. And I want you to see what is the motivating factor of a lot of this. 
Now, this is God, as we read in, in Acts chapter 22, this was God's plan for this to happen from the beginning. But it's still not a pretty sight, is it? It was preordained by God for this to happen. But I want to see what seemed to be the controlling factor here. And the controlling factor is anger. It's anger. And when I say controlling factor, it's when anger takes over the person and trumps them of their other abilities, if you will. Notice the verse in verse 15, that he cried out, away with him, crucify him. I kind of read that, but I, I did not read that like they would say it. Because I imagine it would have had a lot more emotion and a lot louder. What happens when we get angry? What happens? That all our other emotions seem to go down, and that one emotion seems to rise to the surface and takes control over everything else in our body. Have you ever noticed that? The only thing that matters is the anger or the rage or the mob mentality. Remember I said these Jews at this point have a mob mentality. Now this is interesting because they're going in, they're ready to, they're on the day of preparation. Let that mean anything? So I'm not a Jew, that don't mean anything to me. I, I've mentioned this before. I had a friend who preaches down south. And, and I, I met him years ago. Mike, he's a friend of Mike Rains, actually. And um, y'all know Mike. He held a gospel meeting here not too long ago. Mike and I got in the car. We went up. Uh, I, he's somewhere around the Atlanta area. We went up to his house in Atlanta. And we got there at the night before on Friday night. And we come into his house and, and he had already gone to sleep. He left the door unlocked for us and told us what bedrooms to have. And so we went, we went to bed and woke up the next morning to good breakfast being cooked and everything very enjoyable. And he looked at us and he goes, I got to noon to be with you guys. And that kind of took me by surprise and Mike already knew that what was going to happen. He goes, we'll do whatever we can to noon. He goes, I, I can't do anything with you guys. Probably have to leave or something after that noon. And my question was, oh, you plans or something? It's the day of preparation for Sunday. And, and thinking like a preacher, oh, you must not have your sermon done yet. No, the sermon was done days ago. From noon to the rest of the day, my family just prepares for worship. And I was kind of floored by that. Wow. Like, do you really need? Yes. We need to prepare for worship. We need, and, and he based it off this, this Old Testament philosophy, if you will, of the day of preparation. The Jews were obligated to prepare for worship the next day. And that took more than 10 minutes in the car on the way here. It was a formal preparation for them to go to worship. They were not allowed to do anything in beginning about 6 o'clock, what we would call 6 o'clock in the evening on. Now what they're doing here seems to be very out of character. And that's the reason I point that out. This is out of character for them. They're come, they, they have let anger control their emotions so much that they're willing to take a man that they just think is guilty of this charge and kill him. Well, so much so when Peter preached his sermon on the day of Pentecost, he accused him of murder. Even those who stood at the foot of the cross and watched, guilty by association, Pilate said, should I crucify your king? If you're going to say this man is the king, should I crucify your king? And the chief priest answered, we have no king but Caesar. Caesar was never the Jews' king at all in any way, shape, or form. 
Matthew 27, verse 22 says, Pilate said of them then, what shall I do with Jesus who is called Christ? They said, let him be crucified. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 22, I say to you that everyone who is angry Let's sink in for a moment. Jesus' first sermon he says, let's talk about it. I, I wonder if he knew at that point that it was going to be really anger that was going to send him to the cross. Trial. We know the trial wasn't fair. We know the trial that they broke so many Jewish and, and Roman laws that it's crazy. We know that it was controlled by emotion and anger, and, and we ended up with the situation that we have. Jesus says, I, I, Everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. I think this is a, a base anger here because Jesus goes on to say whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council and whoever says to his brother you fool will be liable to hell fire. I wonder what the charge would be for them. And they're so emotionally caught up in this, following the crowd, that they say crucify him. It's interesting, Jesus tells a parable later on in Matthew, Matthew chapter 18, where a man that owed a lot of money, but he had got his debts forgiven. And he had someone who owed him not very much money. And verse 34 says, an anger his master divided, or his master delivered him to the jailers. He owed someone a ton of money, basically, and that person was able to forgive him. But but he's no, no, no. Because of the anger that I have, he, you're going to be, you're going to go to jail until you've paid all the debt. Paul would say this in Ephesians four and verse thirty-one: Let all bitterness, wrath, anger. Calamity and slander be put away from you. <clears throat> I know it was part of God's plan for Jesus to go to the cross. But when we think of the situation that Pilate and the Jews were facing that day, I don't want you to be reluctant, not obeying Jesus. Say, well, I wish I would have done that. I think there's going to be a lot of people on that day, a lot. I don't know the numbers. I just think there's going to be a lot of people on that day say, I wish I would have just taken that step. I wish I would have just obeyed the gospel. I wish someone would have told me. There's going to be others that would say, well, I wish somebody would have told me about the gospel. I think there's going to be people that want to say, Jesus is my king. And I think there's going to be people that say, I don't know why I let anger control my life so much. This morning, if you're not a Christian, we encourage you to do that. If you need prayers, we'll pray with you and pray for you. Won't you come as we stand? As we stand.
thank Ellis for another good lesson from God's Word. Once again, we're certainly glad to see everyone out this morning. I'd like to see everyone back this evening for evening worship. Is there anything else that needs to be announced? If you'll bow with me, we'll have a prayer and we'll be dismissed. Our Father in Heaven, we're so grateful for the opportunity that you've given us to gather together to worship your high and holy name. Father, we pray that the things said and done here this morning were pleasing in your sight. We pray, Father, that as we leave here and go to our separate homes, that you'll be with each of us, give us safe passage. We ask, Father, that you'll bring us all back together at the next point in time. And we pray, Father, for your guidance as we go about our lives. Help us always to be shining your light to those around us. It's through Jesus' name that we pray.